baseball is bike, the NBA, soon to be bike, NFL. We locked it up, boys and girls. NFL, NFLPA, we've come to an agreement. There shall be football this season. The NFL is bike. Most importantly, we're bike, and it's Titty Tuesday. Thus, my titties are out. I'm going to cover up for y'all, though. Because I know there are children in the audience. As for yesterday's dilemma, you see my picture hanging up there of Steve's parents. So what I ended up doing was I drilled a hole in the wall behind the picture. Two holes like this, as big as my fists. I'm going to make snacks stand on the other side holding the picture. He put glue on his fingers and he put his fingers through the hole. And he's actually been out there for the last 24 hours. And he'll remain out there forever unless he wants to get fired by me so we're gonna be talking about some running backs in fantasy football this year some 2020 2020 fantasy football running bikes that we can consider sleepers they're late round guys they're breakout candidates guys that are going in the ninth round or later i'm not going to start talking to you about darius guys i'm not going to talk to you about these rookie running backs who are going too early to be considered sleepers i think the best way to identify running back sleepers look at those early round picks and identify the riskiest early round running back picks right we did that last week i made a video my top five riskiest running backs being picked within the first three rounds. Logical math would tell you that if they are risky, the player behind them might be a good pick to break out this year. The reason those guys are getting drafted so highly is because the opportunity is there, right? It's high risk, high reward, high volume, high volume for the backup as well. As a reminder of the guys that I threw into that video last week, we had Dalvin Cook, Kenyon Drake, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, James Conner, Todd Gurley, all guys going within the first three rounds of fantasy drafts this year all wildly risque so we're gonna dive into that list behind them as well as some other sleepers at the end of the video that have nothing to do with those guys and just a reminder we have started bike up saturday q a for the patreons every saturday 1 p.m eastern time i will be going live on youtube answering all y'all's questions whatever they may be redraft dynasty margarita making tips trades waiver wire when we go in season i'll be doing it every single saturday from now through the end of the nfl season because we force that shit into existence baby and it's happening and so is q a saturday but it's for the patrons only as i said so sign up on patreon.com forward slash b d g e there's a bunch of other stuff you'll get along with access to the q a i will be putting those videos online afterwards possibly that day or the next day so y'all will get to watch what we talk about but if you want to be inside the discussion if you want to actually hang out with me in real time and ask your personalized questions that is how you do so patreon.com forward slash bdge i'm ready to get into the video so it's time to tuck our shirts in stop yelling it's tuesday and let's eat Also, monster fanatics out there, they came out with two new sugar-free, zero sugar drinks. This is one of them. Ultra Rosa. Slaps like some cheeks. 10 out of 10 would recommend. I haven't tried the other flavor yet. Someone else tries it. I think it's green. Maybe like teal. I don't know. Let's talk some fantasy. The first guy up on this list, I want to preface, this is the earliest guy being picked in draft. So everyone after Alexander Madison will be a later round pick. Alexander Madison right now, of course, his ADP is creeping up because of all the rumors behind Dalvin Cook. Again, we're kind of going to go down that list of the riskiest early round running backs that I have and why their backup is a good pick. Alexander Madison, current ADP of 87, RB36. So he's officially an RB3 per ADP of FFPC, high stakes draft. Admittedly, I was not a big fan of Alexander Madison coming out as like a college prospect. I didn't think he was very versatile. I didn't think he's a guy that even if given the workload, he could perform at a high level but he definitely did his thing last year and it seems to be that there might be some opportunity in 2020 for fucking move up everybody's trying to hold me down today there's opportunity for madison in 2020 because it seems like dalvin cook's got a whole lot of people in the kitchen with him but um, the holdout talks the injuries all concerns when it comes to a guy like dalvin cook but i want to i want to play devil's advocate for alexander madison because he is actually somewhat of a polarizing player i believe i didn't include him in yesterday's video but if you guys did enjoy that video where we talked about polarizing players let me know down below and I, i'm thinking about doing a part two to that we have to be real here if dalvin cook is on the field if he signs and he's back with the vikings madison is strictly a handcuff you are not 
drafting him for standalone value. Now, I'm not going to include other guys on this list that are handcuffs, right? And people will get excited about because because if their starter gets hurt, then he'll you're like fucking obviously, but then you have to put that as a common denominator for every single fantasy player. And it wipes out the advantage that you're even talking about to begin with. However, I think Dalvin Cook does give you multiple outs to get Madison on the field. This is something I've talked about probably for the entirety of the offseason. Like guys like Tony Pollard, guys like Latavius Murray, they have zero redraft value outside of the starter getting hurt. The biggest way to know who the fish are out there that tell you to draft people are the ones telling you to draft Tony Pollard, are the ones telling you to draft Latavius Murray. It's the laziest analysis out there, and it makes no fucking sense. When we look at what Madison did last year, before Dalvin Cook got hurt, week 11, Madison had one game of more than 7.4 fantasy points. Here's the problem with Madison. While he saw seven and a half carries per game, and that's higher than a typical backup, he got zero valuable touches when it comes to the touches that make you a, a valuable fantasy asset, right? less than half a target per game, one rushing touchdown on the year. The two most valuable touches for fantasy running backs are the carries inside the five-yard line, the goal line carries, and receptions. That was literally all Dalvin Cook when he was on the field. So here's the way I look at it, right? This is an extremely running back friendly fantasy offense. And depending on how the many spices of Cook's future bake out, Madison could end up being the guy. To me, he looks like strictly a, a backup, a handcuff at this point, but he gives you more outs, more ways to get onto the field because of Cook's risks than those guys like Tony Pollard and Latavius Murray. All I'm saying with Madison, and I wanted to preface with him because, again, he is a polarizing guy. Minnesota has told us nothing about Alexander Madison being a fixture of this offense if Dalvin Cook is on the field. If Dalvin Cook signs, if Dalvin Cook is healthy, Madison gets zero valuable touches when it comes to fantasy. I just want you guys to know that. I want y'all to remember that. I try to tell you the storyline that a player had in the previous year so we can really put context behind what they're going to give us in 2020. So let's move to a real, a real running back sleeper that I think most of y'all should be targeting in your drafts later in the drafts. We talked about Kenyon Drake. I think he's one of the riskiest picks in fantasy football this year in the early rounds. The guy behind him, Chase Edmonds, man. I really, really, really like Chase Edmonds. Currently going off the board, 130. Running back, 52. You can give me all the Chase Edmonds. I've drafted four teams this summer, officially. As of right now, I've drafted four teams. Some of them Dynasty, some of them Redraft, the Scott Fishbowl. I own zero shares of Kenyon Drake. I own three shares out of the four leagues. I own Chase Edmonds in three of them. Just a quick synopsis if you missed last week's Risky Running Back video. What's wrong with Kenyon Drake? One, we have an eight-year sample size of him never doing it for an entire year. We don't know if he can hold up as a workhorse running back for the entirety of a year. We don't know, even if he does hold up, if he can hold up. See, this is the other underrated part. When you get the workhorse touches, if you can stay on the field and stay healthy, are you still efficient with those touches? We've seen tons of running back get the volume, but can't give you that sort of efficiency that they gave you in a four game or a six game sample size over the course of 16 games. It's a lot harder than it looks. Just because you get the volume doesn't mean you're going to be good with the volume. But more importantly, going back to the advanced metrics, Drake's, Drake was just not a good running back last year by himself. His breakaway run rate, the percentage of his runs that went for 15 plus yards, which is basically your explosiveness, was 25th in the NFL. More importantly, his evaded tackles per attempt were 49th, yards created per carry were 49th, 57th in yards created per touch, but the run blocking efficiency that he got from the Arizona offensive line was fourth amongst all running backs in the NFL. And you might be like, that's odd because Arizona's run blocking offensive line was terrible, but not when Kenyon Drake was on the field. From a receiving standpoint, we look at Drake as this athlete, this three down workhorse, this guy who can kind of do it all because he had the volume last year. 34th out of 41 running backs last year in yards per target. He ranked 30th of 41 in yards per reception. And yes, this is from week nine forward when he was on the Cardinals. So I know a lot of you guys asked that in the comment section down below. When we look at Chase Edmonds, he was an absolute workhorse in college at Fordham. And I know it's Fordham, but Three straight years of 280 touches. He showed that he can handle the volume. And not only did he have three straight years of 280 plus touches, three straight years of 20 total touchdowns. We saw him explode last year against the Giants when they gave him that role. And there was no Kenyon Drake there. It was Chase Edmonds. They didn't want to play David Johnson. Chase Edmonds went nuts. Edmonds just makes way too much sense for a guy who... I, there's there's just no way Kenyon Drake's going to continue to get 25 touches a game. Edmonds is going to have a role to start the year. It might be small to begin with, but it's going to grow as the season grows, and he continues to show efficiency every time he's on the field. This is a team that scores a ton of points via the running back in fantasy, so give me Chase Edmonds literally 10 rounds later than Kenyon Drake. After Kenyon Drake, we talked about Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. 
and how the risk is that there is a real running back by committee with himself and Damian Williams. And Damian Williams has been awesome for the Chiefs when they've actually given him the role of being the workhorse. When he's on the field, he's awesome. I can't really talk about Damian Williams being a sleeper because right now he's going off the board 69th overall. I don't know which way to fucking put that. As running back 31. So that, that's far from a sleeper. I'm not drafting Damian Williams that early. So we'll, we'll continue to move along. Next guy on the list, James Conner. If you've been following me since like March when we started Dynasty and Rookie Talk, you know that there is no one I love more than Run AMC, Anthony McFarland, the fourth round pick out of Maryland. Currently basically undrafted. 168 overall, running back 59. He was one of the first prospects that I actually looked at and I watched the tape for and I was like, yep. This is my man. When you look at his box score from college, it's not really going to tell you much about who he was as a player until you get context behind it. His first year with Maryland, you see that first year, he rips off a thousand rushing yards, over a thousand rushing yards on 131 carries. That is 7.9 yards per carry, sirs. He only scored four rushing touchdowns. All four of them came from 25 plus yards out. Three of four came from at least 64 yards out. It was a 64 yarder, 75 yarder, and 81 yarder. This dude has so much home run ability, just sitting inside him, marinating, waiting to do it in black and yellow. The Steelers fans are going to absolutely love Anthony McFarlane. I want to help put context behind what happened in the next year. He was so good at 2018 season, 2019, he dips off. The first game they played in 2019 was against Howard. Maryland won the game 79 to zero. 79 to 0. You don't need to use AMC when you're winning the game fucking 79 to 0. These are video game scores. That game actually made NCAA football look like real life. So Anthony McFarlane got seven touches in that first game, scored two touchdowns on the seven touches. They didn't need to use him. The next game, he goes for 130 total yards from scrimmage, three touchdowns. Week three at Temple, 132 yards, 26 carries, 132 yards, a touchdown, boom. He's all, he's out of the gate red hot this 2019 season, looking to make a splash, looking to make himself a legit running back prospect, and then the high ankle sprain happens in week four against Penn State. Suffers a high ankle sprain, and nothing was the same. NWTS for my man's AMC. Because I wanted to make sure I got context behind all of this and make sure I wasn't just making this shit up. The head coach at Maryland was talking about into like weeks 10, into weeks not, like very late into the season. Yeah, he's like AMC lost his explosiveness. He's still dealing with this high ankle sprain, something that's probably going to linger through the end of the season. So the statistics after those first three games are all skewed by the high, high ankle sprain. The same thing that we saw with Saquon last year, the same thing that we saw with Alan Kamara. I truly believe that if AMC was healthy, if he didn't suffer that high ankle sprain in week four last year against Penn State, State, he would have been much, much, much more highly coveted in the NFL scene. But everyone looks at the box scores. They see the last few games. They don't look back to 2018. They look back at what have you done for me lately? And then finally, towards the end of the season, he gets back healthy. Their last game at Michigan State. Tough opponent. Eight carries, 134 yards, and a touchdown. Added a 40-yard kick return to it. The guy was back to his explosive self. The guy was ready to roll. And then they draft him. Fourth round, Pittsburgh Steelers. So the way I look at Anthony McFarland, he has a very, very smooth first cut. He does sometimes rely too much on his pure speed, but I think you could probably think of worse things to rely on when you run a 4-4-4. 40. Loose hips. He is elusive at the line of scrimmage. So think of like Darrell Henderson, who's got that long speed, but he's actually able to move laterally. Now, Steelers fans, you might have to help me out a little bit here. I believe the last time Pittsburgh had a guy like this, this is what I love about Anthony McFarland. He has this skill set that no one else in the Steelers backfield has. And I think once y'all get a glimpse of that, you get a little taste of that speed. It's going to be hard not to use him at a pretty high capacity this season. I want to say the last time y'all had someone like him with explosion and long speed was, was Willie Parker. I'm no Steeler historian, but I want to say that that's correct. Willie Parker, exact same build as Anthony McFarland. 5'9", 5'10", 210 pounds. You look at Willie Parker. He had a pretty, pretty damn good run during his days in yellow and black. Look at 2005 through 2007. They gave no fucks about him being 5'9", 210 pounds. I don't think they're going to give a fuck about Anthony McFarlane being that size. So I mentioned before, and this is just a ridiculous stat. See, this is what happens when I start doing these videos, when I start doing research and, and taking notes and stuff. I just dive into these deep, sick holes that no one should be in. And I'm looking at numbers because I see, okay, Anthony McFarlane, three of those four touchdowns from 2018 came from 64 yards or further and i'm like thinking okay does pittsburgh ever have guys that break off for those long touchdowns so i went back 
into the arch archive. Shout out to Pro Football Reference Screener. In the history of Pittsburgh's regular season, they have had one regular season rushing touchdown of more than 50 yards. Chard Mendenhall did bust off a 50-yard touchdown run, exactly. But more than 50 yards, they have one regular season rushing touchdown of more than 50 yards. It was Willie Parker back in 2005. Now, I know Silly Willie is faster than AMC. I'm pretty sure Willie ran a sub 4-3-4, but y'all get the point here. We need this explosion in black and yellow. Either way, I think McFarlane is a really good prospect, and I think James Conner is just red flags everywhere, stuck into the ground, in injury waiting to happen. I hope AMC gets on the field this year, but I'm very, very confident that he's going to be a, a player and a fixture in this backfield in the future. Again, he's getting picked at like 170, so you could find much, much, much worse sleeper picks here at the running back position later on in drafts. Other notables going past the ADP of 100. Oh, we'll cheat a little bit, but we'll go Matt Breda here. Going off the board, 98th overall, running back 40. I just feel like this is probably going to be a 50-50 split in Miami's backfield. And give me the guy who's going to be playing in passing situations. Give me the more explosive player, the one who can actually create on his own. Jordan Howard's going to be like the goal line guy. Do you really want an in-between the 20s runner on a team that's going to score maybe 17 or 18 points a game? Like how many goal line carries can we expect Jordan Howard to have? Whatever number you're saying in your head right now, it's probably too high. So give me the guy who can rip off a 70-yard touchdown run. Give me the guy who can see 50, 55, 60 targets this year. I want Breida in the 10th round, in the 11th round. If I missed on my running backs early on, I think Breida is a very, very good high upside, low risk back that a lot of people have kind of forgotten about. And of course, the dude can't stay on the field, but when you're drafting him in the double digit rounds, you're not finding guys with the upside that he has. Like a Sony Michelle, like a Zach Moss, two thumpers in the AFC East. So Sony Michelle is going off the board 108 right now, running back 40. Four. The way I look at it is I talked in depth in the bold prediction video, right? Obviously, that was just a bold prediction video. I said Sony Michelle is going to be the highest scoring fantasy running back in the AFC East. Bold prediction. Hot take. It's clickbait season, baby. Sony Michelle, I do think is set up for a good year, though. I do think that with Cam Newton under center, there are going to be much bigger holes, right? And I said New England, Uncle Bill has been following this Baltimore offense very closely over the last two years and seen what they've done with Lamar Jackson. I wouldn't be surprised if they implemented an offense very similar to what Baltimore is doing, letting Cam have free roam over the pocket outside of the pocket and making him more of a mobile quarterback than just a pocket passer, right? That's what's worked so successfully for Baltimore. They're not pulling the strings on Lamar Jackson. They're letting him do what he does best. And I think with that opens up ridiculous running lanes, right? That's the reason why we see Mark Ingram running for five yards per carry. I think we could see something something similar with Sony Michelle. If this is going to be a good team, who else is going to take goal line carries? I know people talk about fucking three carry Damian Harris. The guy literally had less than 10 carries last year. We hear one report oh, Damian Harris might get more involved this year. It's like fucking, it's either he's getting more involved or he's getting cut. I, I would assume that as a third round pick, he's going to be going the fucking former here, but that, that doesn't tell us fucking anything. The Patriots have told us nothing that says Damian Harris is actually going to be a fixture here. So yes, James White's going to be a fixture, but Sonny Michelle should still get touches, should still get valuable carries in this Patriots offense. So I like him all the way down here at 108, running back 44. I like Zach Moss right behind him too. 112, running back 46. Going like five rounds behind Devin Singletary, when Zach Moss is going to get plenty of valuable touches as well. I know Josh Allen takes a lot of the goal line carries, but Zach Moss is going to play that Frank Gore role, like they've said, all offseason, which is 10 to 12 carries a game. And Zach Moss is Zach Moss is a really fun prospect. It's kind of funny because last year, Devin Singletary was the first running back that I started watching tape on when I started diving into rookies, and I fell absolutely in love. He was so much fun to watch in college, just so elusive, so shifty. This year, Zach Moss was the first running back that I put on film, started watching, I fell in love with immediately. Both of these dudes are slow, but both of these dudes had prolific college production. Both of these dudes can contribute on all three downs, but Zach Moss has about 20 pounds on Devin Singletary. Zach Moss is going to be the goal line guy. Zach Moss might work his way into some passing work. Overall, though, Josh Allen doesn't really dump down. He does not check the ball down to his running back. So I don't know how much passing work is really going to be there for Devin Singletary or Zach Moss, whoever it is. But I think Zach Moss has really, really good standalone value. And it wouldn't surprise me if he finished the season with seven rushing touchdowns and finished the season with 160 to 180 touch. Like Devin Singletary makes very little sense where he's going right now relative to the touch difference that them two are going to have. It's probably not going to be much bigger than like 30 touches when when it all is said and done. And most of the valuable touches are probably going to go to Zach Moss. So Zach Moss all the way down here at like running back 50, I think is a phenomenal pick even as a rookie because we don't we don't need rookie running backs 
to get acquainted to the offense. Like there's no one that you have to build chemistry with. With rookie wide receivers, it's tough because you have a diverse route tree. You have to build chemistry with the quarterback. Tight ends, the same thing. You have to learn the blocking schemes. You have to learn the passing schemes. You have to build and develop chemistry with the quarterback. With the running back, you don't need any of that shit. So I will make the case for Zach Moss in redraft leagues as well as going forward, man. I think I think both of these guys can do well going forward. I think both of their ceilings are probably absolutely capped. And I think we will see a couple of years where both Moss and Singletary go for over a thousand yards from scrimmage and it's going to be a backfield to be reckoned with run heavy offense zach moss sign him up as a running back sleeper comment down below who your favorite late round running backs are some guys that you think have breakout potentials some guys that are kind of going unnoticed that will at some point or another during the season be some fantasy darlings oh i forgot to mention todd Gurley too at the end of the list i re- i went nuts last video talking about i don't know how this was actually such a beautiful setup i was like i don't know how but todd Gurley will not get all the work in the backfield i had no way to back it up i literally just said i don't know what's going to happen in that falcons back field but I promise you it ain't going to be Gurley who has the full-time role and then boom Mike Clay posts a article from ESPN the Falcons is 53 man roster projection and there's a quote in it said a lot of players have talked privately about how Brian Hill deserved a shot to be the primary back before Gurley was signed Brian Hill is going to take some work Quadre Allison is going to take some goal line work Edo Smith was hurt all last season he's going to take some pass catching work telling you None of those guys I really want to draft, to be honest with you. I'm not really touting them as a sleeper, but it's just more reason to stay away from girly, all you kids. If you've been enjoying the video and you happen to be interested in getting all of my top sleepers and my undervalued players and the all fade list, the guys you should not be drafting this year, as well as the guys you need to be targeting and jumping up for in drafts to get and the rankings, whatever, it's all included in our draft guide. The big dog draft guide we put it out every summer is completely updated throughout the entirety of the, of the summer, depending on what happens in training camp and preseason, which is not happening. So it's a little bit less work for me, to be honest with you. But directions on how to get the draft guide for $10 plus $25 to play with on monkeyknifefight.com right there. Go to monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you sign up and deposit 10 bucks. Play a game of $2 or more on there and then i will email you access within 24 hours to the draft guide it's literally everything you need for your 2020 fantasy football season you will not find a better product if you think i go in depth with any of my analysis in my videos this is all that and more in there neatly organized and curated straight for the big dogs right there the directions as well will be in the description that's the best way to support thy brand if you don't want to purchase if you're broke like most of us i appreciate any support just a quick thumbs up on the video if you're enjoying subscribe to the channel if you're new we're doing shit like this six seven 13 days a week okay